gave me. Oh, we'll go ahead and stop. Does anybody need a, a copy of this? We'll get them out to you. Did everybody get one? Okay. So everybody's got one now. So another motivation that God gave me in this study is he commands us in Matthew 6. In fact, let's go there. Let's, let's open up the Bible. Start off by reading Matthew chapter 6. Starting with verse 19. Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up treasure, lay not for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, when I read those verses in Scripture, I think, you know, Jesus wants us to set our heart and our affections on the things above. And, you know, he says that not without reward. He wants to motivate us. He wants us to be able to as humans to set our heart and our affections on the things above. So he didn't give us that command to seek ye first the kingdom of God without motivation. There are many rewards in eternity that the Lord promises to those who will serve him more now. My intent is to motivate us to a greater level of service to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through this study. I hope it will do that. I hope it will motivate us there. If we seek the kingdom of God first and foremost and endure suffering for him, the result will be greater glory in the eternity to come. Um, I have a note here. Why don't we just go over to Romans. Romans 8. I want to read these. Great encouragement from Paul for our sufferings. You know, because as I watched Lori suffer in her last days, there's nothing more painful for me to watch. I, I did realize that, Lord, I know you have a reason for this. And I know that the suffering that she's doing and the love that she has for you and the faith that she has in you will be rewarded. Well, let's look at this. In Romans 8, 16 through 18, Paul gives us a little answer on, on the rewards of our suffering. He says that the Spirit itself witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now look what he says here. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Think about that. All of us have different trials as we go through this present life. None of us are the same in the trials that we face. And I'm sure a lot of us have looked at our trials and said, Lord, why? I know I have. Why? Why did you allow her to be taken? How many times did I question that? And Job, when he went through his trials, and and God's answer was, were you here when I laid the foundations of the earth? And of course the answer is no. We don't have the wisdom that he has. We don't know the answers always. But we do know that he's going to reward us for enduring those trials with faith. Without faith it's impossible to please God. And he allows trials. Again, I don't know the answer to that. People will ask, well, why does he allow suffering? But he allows it, according to Paul, for our glory, and it's going to be revealed to us in eternity. So we can look forward to that. We have a God that is a great rewarder of those who will diligently seek him. I've got it written down here in your outline, Hebrews 11:6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him, 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, first off, your faith must be in God and Jesus Christ, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He will reward you for diligently seeking him. And I can remember the, even the grace that God bestowed on me and Lori as we went through those last days. God will, as you go through your last days, I'm, I'm promising you, if you'll put your faith and trust in him, he will pour out the grace that's sufficient for your trial. He'll, he'll not give you more than you can endure. So we know and understand heaven if we search the scripture. And that's what we're going to do for the next 15 weeks. We're going to just dig and compare scripture with scripture. And I've had people say, well, you know, you can't really know. You know, they'll quote that verse, I hath not seen nor ear heard the wonders of, of what God has planned for us. But, but they end there. They don't go on. Let's, so let's read it together. Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And instead of just reading that verse 9, let's read the rest of it. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But don't stop there. It doesn't end there. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. So right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, you're getting the uh, inference from Paul that you can know. Why? Because we have the Spirit of God in us, and we do have many things revealed to us in the Word of God. Now to the unregenerate man, this is foolishness. But to us who are regenerated, who have the Holy Spirit, we have the power of God and through his Holy Spirit to understand. That's what we're going to do for the next few weeks. We're going to get a greater understanding of heaven. Let's read the rest of it. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. God freely gave us much information about heaven in the word of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in words which, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual with spiritual. So the Holy Ghost is going to teach us the things that God has prepared for us. And man, he has a future prepared for us that you, you would believe, because you know our God, don't you? He's a wonderful God. God is good. And... Uh, Satan has to get permission from him to bring that trial into your life. God will allow it. He allowed it with Job. He allowed it, he allowed it with me. And trials will come, but he'll give you the strength for it. And he's going to reward you for it, depending on how you, you put your faith in him. We're going to talk about some of that. We're going to talk about rewards. The purpose of our study, I've, I've divided for the purpose of our study, point number four in your outline, I've divided the believer's eternity, or what Christendom calls going to heaven, into four phases. Now, these are my phases. They're, they're not necessarily found in the Word of God. This is phase one. But I've divided it up that way. And uh, we're going to really, anything I say, I'm going to try and dig, in, I'm going to dig into Scripture and show you the verses that support what I'm saying. And if through this study I'm doing a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking, I'll let you know. And then we'll, we'll have discussions on some of what we know about our God and how wonderful he is. So we'll have lots of uh, discussions throughout uh, the 15 weeks. Uh, this week is just an, an outline and an overview, or I should say an introduction and an overview, so a 40-minute introduction. But I want you to know what we're going to cover so you'll, you'll, you'll just have a, a basic idea of what we're looking forward to. 
So we're going to talk about four phases. Phase one is the present heaven. This is where all believers go immediately after they die. Our bodies die physically. Paul calls it sleep. The Word of God calls it sleep. But our spirit and soul go into the immediate presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. The study of the present heaven will bring to light the false doctrine of soul sleep. Have you ever heard uh, people say, well, you know, it's soul sleep. You, you die and, and you wait for the rapture. And uh, Well, we're going we're gonna to give verses that tear that false doctrine apart and uh, give biblical support for that. Phase two of the believer's eternity begins at the rapture of the church. When our new bodies are resurrected, joined with our spirit and soul, and then return to the present heaven with Jesus. So, that's phase two. After the rapture, God pours out his wrath and judgment on the Jewish people. He's dealing with the Jews during the uh, tribulation. And a Christ-rejecting Gentile world. There's going to come a time when God is no longer going to strive with man. And God in his wisdom, I believe, you know, some people say, well, that seems kind of cruel that his wrath would come out. At some point, God's wisdom is going to decide that my wrath is needed at this time to bring my people to their knees and in actuality, his wrath will bring more people to him than we could ever see soul winning. And I had people say, well, you know, the gospel hasn't gone out into all four corners of the world. I said, you're, you're reading the middle of the tribulation period. There's an angelic force that brings the gospel out into all corners of the world. 144,000 witnesses, and of course the, the, two, the two witnesses. That happens after we're gone. That does not have to happen before we go. The rapture's imminent. could happen at any day. The second coming, by the way, won't be. Because any of those who have listened to us at all or know anything about the Bible, when we're raptured, are going to know, as soon as they see that treaty sign, seven years. So it won't be a surprise to them. The thing that's going to come as a thief in the night is the rapture. And we, oh, don't we look forward to it. Man, I'll tell you, I look forward to it. So we're going to talk about that. In Jeremiah 37, I have it written down here for you. And I want to, I want to talk about this because it's uh, the tribulation period. We get raptured, we're in heaven. During this tribulation period, it's known as the time of Jacob's trouble. Look at the verse. It says, Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And when he says that day, he's talking about the day in the broad sense, the day of God's wrath, that day, the tribulation period, and the millennial reign is a judgment on the earth. We rule as kings and priests with our Savior Jesus Christ. He rules from Jerusalem. Matthew 24, 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in a holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And he's referring to Daniel 9, 27. I've got that one also in your outlines. If you will, turn to it and read with me. Because Jesus here is talking about the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel's prophecy. And so we'll read this together. And he, talking about the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now in the 70 weeks, the week is... is uh, is a uh, seven-year period, so the 70 weeks is 490 years. And prophecy has been fulfilled for all but seven of those, 483 years. And uh, I just want to point out that nowhere in Daniel do you see a gap. It was a mystery that Paul later said God had given him revelation to the mystery of the dispensation of grace. The prophets, the, the 
apostles knew nothing about it. It was revealed to them. So if you look at this verse, you'll see that at some point in time, the Antichrist is going to confirm a covenant with the Jews. And it's going to last for seven years. And, you know, both the Bible and ancient Judaism teach of a seven-year or a period of time of birth pangs, severe birth pangs upon the earth before the Messiah's return. So they knew of that. And uh, the Bible, in our English translation, uses uh, the word sorrows for it. But these are the birth pangs that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 24. I don't know if you've ever read Matthew 24 with that perspective. But do that sometime. Read the entire chapter with the perspective that it is Jesus giving the apostles an outline of the book of Revelation from chapter 6 through 19. He's telling the apostles, he's answering their question about when will the second coming be. And he's telling them about those birth pangs, those sorrows, the beginnings of sorrows. And then he, in, the, in, chap, in uh, verse 15 of Matthew 24, right there in the middle, talks about this that we just read, where the covenant is broken. And then you enter the last three and a half years of the tribulation. So we're going to talk about that point in phase two. Because what I want us to see is that when God raptures the church, then he pours out his wrath upon the earth. We are not prepared, we are not saved unto wrath, unto God's wrath. We're saved unto eternal life. And those that teach that, you know, you're going to go through parts of it, that's not a very, uh, you know, if you ever think about the, the simile that we drew up for you in Ephesians, how that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Well, Jesus has gone into a far country. What kind of a groom-to-be to take his bride would he be if he knew that he was going to leave his bride in some of the worst wrath the world has ever seen and didn't care? Not a very good, uh, not a very good groom-to-be. And he's going to return before that happens, and so would a good a groom would return for his wife. So we're going to talk about that a little bit in phase two. Phase three of our study will cover the millennial reign of Christ. It begins at the tribulation period when Jesus returns to this present earth. You know, they talk about global warming and uh, they talk about, you know, well, we've only got 12 years left. I got news for them. We got at least 1,007 years left of this earth remaining where it's at if the rapture's today. And there's a lot of theologians, and I, I, we'll talk about this later, a lot of commentaries, too, that believe that it's not necessarily true that immediately after the rapture, we're going to see that we just talked about in Daniel, where the treaty signed with the Jews. The Antichrist might not be revealed immediately. Some people talk about there could be a few months, a, a year, whatever, to set that up. Um, but we do know that once that treaty is signed, there's seven years left. And we'll be looking down on it from heaven. That'll be our vantage point. So phase three, we're going to study the millennial reign. And uh, during this time of the millennial reign, we're going to rule with Jesus as kings and priests. Those that return with Jesus will consist of the Old Testament saints, the church age saints, and the saints martyred during the tribulation. So we're going to break those down. We're going to look at each scripture on them. Again, today is just an overview. So we're not going to go to the scripture. Uh, but look at uh, the verse I left for you here. In uh, Revelation 1.6, it says, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then in verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Then phase four, we're going to talk about the new heaven and new earth with the new city Jerusalem on it. At the end of 1,000 year reign, Satan is loosed for a season and gathers his armies to battle. 
against the saints, God will destroy those armies with fire and cast Satan into the lake of fire, where Satan, death, and hell will remain for eternity. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, hell is a really a temporary store, just like the present heaven is a temporary place for us. We don't remain in the present heaven forever. Um, as you know, we come back here with Jesus for a thousand years, then after that, we take a short pit stop at the uh, great white throne where the lost will be judged, and then we go to the new heaven and the new earth. Hell is also a temporary place. It's temporary for the lost because at the great white throne, the bodies of those in hell will be raised or resurrected and stand at the great white throne, and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. The end uh, for eternity, for lost people, is the lake of fire. So hell's just temporary. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. Um, let's all turn, well, actually I got this in the outline too, but you can open your Bible to that too if you like. Revelation chapter 20. We're going to start with verse 7. Revelation chapter 20. In fact, I, I'm going to open the word here just in case I've got all the context that I want for my point here. Yeah. So we're going to start with verse 7. Because this, this talks directly to the fourth phase that we're going to cover. The, the phase that is our eternal destiny, the new heaven and new earth. Let's read it together. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And you can look this up later. Uh, you can read about it in Ezekiel 38, 1 through 16. The key to Ezekiel 38 and 39, by the way, just real quick note, um, Ezekiel 38, um, the war spoken of there, um, actually is the, the post-millennial war after Satan is loosed. And the reason you know that is it ends with fire from God. Ezekiel 39, if you read that war, ends with the fowls of the earth feasting and the great supper of God, which is the war and destruction right before the millennial reign. Also, chapter 39 deals with the burying for seven months of the dead from that war and the destruction of all the weapons of war for seven years. They're busy burning and destroying all those weapons of destruction. So that's the way I remember it. It helps me differentiate, well, what war goes with what in Revelation, and so I, I put that in here. You can look it up. Um, verse 9, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them, and you'll see that in Ezekiel thirty-eight twenty-two. and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, as you read this, you may be, you know, I always wondered, man, for a thousand years, we're on this earth in perfect peace with the most godly king anyone could possibly have, God himself, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, ruling and reigning, perfect peace on the earth. And, and those that are not committed to Jesus Christ, because there will be, uh, the, the earth will be repopulated, then there will be people who have not given their heart to Christ. They're deceived, and they actually go against this righteous ruler and his saints. It, it's the most puzzling thing to me, and it just shows the, the deceitful and wickedness of man's heart and how easily we're deceived by the God of this world, the, the powers and principalities, 
that Paul speaks about that we fight against. And thank God we have the Holy Spirit and we're fit for the battle because of that. Um, look at point two under that scripture. I put that God at this point judges all of mankind at the great white throne judgment. Then death and hell are forever at this point cast into the lake of fire. So again, my point looking at this scripture and understanding is that hell is a temporary storage for the wicked. Revelation 20, 11 through 14 in your outlines. And I saw a great white throne. So this is going to support what I just said. And again, this is the last phase of our study. We're going to talk about how the millennial age ends and all of the prophecy concerning the bringing in of the new heaven and new earth. And this is part of it. Revelation 20.11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. We're going to talk about that later. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. So all the evil thoughts, all the evil deeds they did their entire life is going to be displayed. And they're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. And we'll be at that judgment with Jesus behind him in support of him. Paul talks about that. He says, don't you know that you're going to judge the earth? So that's going to be an interesting study when we get into that. Then verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I also, I'll use this verse, this uh, Revelation 20, 14, the second death, and uh, I think it's also mentioned in uh, 21, 8. Same thing. This is the second death. Whenever you're talking to folks about uh, Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death, or 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You need to explain to folks that it's not just a physical death. There's a spiritual death. There's an eternal separation from God called the second death. So this is a good jump off verse to just kind of show them what you're talking about in there. We, we call it the Romans road, but sometimes you need to jump out of there and kind of explain something, and, and this will help them get the, the picture of eternity separated from God in a place of torment forever and ever. Point three under this, I've put that God will destroy the present heaven and earth and usher in the new heaven and new earth, which will come down from God out of heaven. So I always tell people, isn't it wonderful that we have this written in the Word of God. We know that the new city, Jerusalem, is going to come down out of heaven from God onto the new earth. What does that tell us about where the new city, Jerusalem, is right now? Anybody? It's in heaven, right? So we know that those who have gone before us have seen their, the place that Jesus has gone to prepare for them. The apostles have seen it. My wife's seen it. What a beautiful city. And we're going to talk about that beautiful city a little bit, too. 2 Peter 3.10. Now, let's finish reading that, that note I put for you in point three. It's very important because there's some variances in the commentaries on this. I side with theologians and commentaries that believe the present heaven and earth are totally destroyed and the new heaven and earth are a new creation. And here's why. And, and I'm going to get into it a little more detail as we go through the weeks. But I want you to look at 2 Peter chapter 3, 10 through 13. I put it in your outline. We'll read it together real quick. I've got five minutes left. We'll try to get through. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And the ele oh, look at this. And the very elements shall melt with a fervent heat. 
the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Then Peter goes on to say, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt away with a fervent heat? Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heaven and new earth. That's why I think it's a new creation wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, and we're going to talk about this a lot, this verse, think about this. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things are coming, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. This is the fourth and final phase of the believer's eternity. This is our eternal destiny, the new heaven and new earth. All of God's original plans for mankind and his creation will be restored to his glorious original intent. Only better. The best is yet to come, folks. The best is yet to come. The new earth will be a paradise, absent the curse of sin. God will again dwell with man and man with God. There will be no more sorrow, sickness, pain, or death. Let's read Revelations 21, through, uh, 21 1 through 8 together. And I saw the new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely. Praise God, huh? It's going to be done. Victory. God gets the final victory. He that overcometh, that's you guys, that's us, right? We overcome. We are overcomers in Christ. Shall inherit all things, not some, all things. We'll have complete dominion over the earth, restored to what Adam and Eve have. Adam and Eve are the only ones that know what that was like to have complete dominion over the earth. We're going to have that back. And it says, we'll inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, there it is, Revelation 21, 8. This is a good one to use with uh, Romans 6, 23. But the fearful and unbelieving, I always put that at the top of the list, folks. I always, at, when I'm at their door, I'll say, if you're unbelieving, look what you're ready for here. If, you're not, if you don't accept Christ. The fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So let's summarize. Let's summarize my introduction and overview. <laughs> so as a result of our study of heaven, this is what I want us to walk away with. This is why I wrote the thesis. The desire in each of us, I hope, for a closer walk with Jesus Christ. Just a closer walk with thee. Huh? A greater love for Jesus, the wonderful future he's purchased for us. And you realize what he's purchased for us. I hope this will really motivate us. That our affections will be on the things above and not on the things of this earth, the temporal things. We'll get a refocus, if you will. I want us to understand that God loves us and wants to reward us. There's a lot of people that say, well, you know, I'm not in it for reward. I just love God. Yes, yes. We do things because we love God. That's admirable. But God is a loving Father and so wants to reward you. He so wants to reward you. But we'll talk about how we can lose and suffer loss and how the, that our rewards are given and manifest at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to talk about that. Point D. I hope we get an understanding of the inheritance we have in Jesus Christ. The 
magnitude of it. It's so great, and I hope we'll see that as we study together. That we'll have a high degree of understanding of our final destination, a new earth, our new country. And we'll share a common joy about where we're headed. A better understanding of the chronology and events of each of the four phases that I've just outlined. I know I brushed over them today, um, but that's what an introduction does in an overview. So you know what we're headed for, right? Note, I agree with Paul's statement in Romans 8.18 where he says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that be, will be revealed in us. Folks, as we study this, I know you're going to agree with this. And I hope this study will help those who are suffering, who have lost loved ones, to know that your suffering and your hardships and your enduring temptation for him will not go unnoticed. As we focus on the things of, above, I hope the worldly things of this life will pale. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed, when? In the last time. Oh, the glory that's going to be revealed. But now, they desire a better country. Don't we desire a better country, folks? Aren't we looking forward to it? I am. That is, in heavenly, wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. To that end, we're sealed unto redemption. Ephesians 4.30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So we're sealed, we're kept by the power of God. Jesus is going to return soon, and he's bringing his reward with him. We're going to talk about those rewards. And I'll close with, this, with these thoughts. You can read the uh, summary I have on the rewards. I hope you will. I hope you look up. Uh, the verses that we really went through fast today, you'll look them up again. But look at those four points the, on the rewards. It's so important. And I put the rewards into phase two. I thought that was a logical play since our rewards will be handed out at the judgment seat of Christ or manifest to us. We'll realize them. And so I thought they fit in that phase two during the tribulation. The Bible's very clear. Our rewards or lack thereof does not determine your salvation. You're saved by faith and not works. If you're born again, you can't lose your salvation. However, your rewards, which God has intended for you since the, he laid the foundations of the earth, can, you can suffer loss of some or most of those. So the encouragement of this whole, and I'll close with this thought, the encouragement of this whole thesis, this whole topic on heaven, is that each of us will be inspired to live more godly in this present time. I get so tired of the people that will say, well, you guys are the easy believism crowd. You've, you've heard that before, right? Oh, you, you have your eternal security. That gives you license to sin. We will study in Scripture that that is the furthest thing from the truth. We teach that it's imperative that you live godly in this present time or you will suffer loss. And I want us all to really study that part really effectively. And we'll have discussions on that as we get to it. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for all the jewels that you gave us in your word on the eternal destiny of the saints, a place called heaven. And Lord, I, I thank you for your love that you went to the cross and purchased that eternal reward for us. Lord, we're eternally grateful to you, and we so look forward to the day that you come for your church. Lord, until then, help each one of us in this study learn and be inspired to live more godly and glorify you with what's left of our lives in Jesus' name.